Uh, good morning once again. Um, before we begin, is there anyone who would like to open class in prayer? Okay, I can uh, pray and open the class. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this time. We thank you for bringing us all together here. Thank you, uh, Lord, that you are the one who has given us your word and you have given us your Holy Spirit to, um, to open our eyes, to enable us to understand uh, what you want to communicate, Lord, through your word. Uh, Father, we pray that as we begin this class and uh, as we uh, finish uh, the last hour of class for today, Lord, that you would um, you would give us the energy, the strength, the inspiration to uh, to stay focused, to hear from you, Lord. Uh, we pray, Father, that we would hear your voice speaking to us. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would be our teacher, that you would be the one uh, revealing your truth to us, Lord. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to be here together, to learn together, um, and Lord, to grow in you together. We bless this time, Lord, uh, in the name of Jesus, and we pray, Lord, uh, that you would guide and lead us and your presence would be in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So um, on Monday, we, we finished um, a little bit of a discussion on the book of Matthew. I won't go back into that. Uh, but we did start with the book of Mark, so I'll just uh, do a recap of what we did from Mark, and then uh, we'll continue into the Gospel of Mark. So uh, we looked at the fact that the Gospel of Mark was initially a Gospel that was not given a lot of importance because it uh, it was so much shorter than the book of Matthew and Luke, and Matthew was the popular gospel in the early church. Uh, but in present day scholarship, Matt, uh, Mark has uh, increased in importance because of um, this recognition that Mark was used as a base uh, or a source for the writing of the other uh, synoptic gospels, which is Matthew and Luke. Um, so uh, this is why Mark is now has now gained importance uh, generally among Christian circles. Uh, so Mark presents Jesus mostly uh, from the perspective of the things he did. Uh, so we see a lot of action, uh, a lot of activity, a lot of ministry happening in the book of Mark. Um, we see words like straight away immediately, just uh, that sense of Jesus moving from one thing to another, uh, responding to needs around him. Um, if you read the book of Mark, you will see uh, that there's just constantly one miracle after the next recorded. So there's no um, not a lot of narrative or not a lot of teaching, not a lot of, um, not as many parables as the book of Matthew. Uh, most of it is focused on the miracles of Jesus. And um, the book of Matthew was written uh, primarily for the Gentiles, so for Roman Christians. And we looked at one example between the book of Matthew and the book of Mark and how they recorded differently based on the audience that they were. Uh, writing to. Um, we also discussed how Mark is um, pretty honest in his record of the life and ministry of Jesus. Um, so he doesn't try to paint the disciples uh, as 
perfect or uh, superhuman. Uh, neither does he do that with Jesus nor with the disciples. Um, he shows us how the disciples don't understand Jesus's ministry. They don't understand his uh, miracles. They don't understand uh, when he's telling them that he's going to uh, die and be raised from the dead. All of that, even though they're with him, they're walking with him, they're seeing his uh, ministry, they're seeing his power, uh, it just doesn't fully um, fully settle in their minds. And even though in the middle of uh, the book of Mark, Peter uh, declares Jesus as the Messiah, he still doesn't understand what that means for Jesus to be the Messiah. Because right after that, we see um, the record of Jesus talking about his suffering and Peter rebukes Jesus for talking about him uh, himself in that way. So that understanding of Jesus as this Messiah and Jesus as one who would suffer, those two things um, didn't really uh, was it weren't something that the disciples were able to comprehend um, during Jesus's ministry. And so Mark presents that very honestly. Uh, he um, especially considering that the disciples were the leaders of the church, uh, he didn't try to paint them as perfect in any way. Um, we see uh, Jesus' relatives who misunderstood uh, the work that he was doing, his family who didn't understand what he was doing. And then he also presents Jesus uh, very um, openly, Jesus, uh, presenting Jesus' anger, his sadness, his amazement uh, with people's lack of faith. All of those things are, um, are presented in ways that people can relate to Jesus and relate to the disciples. Um, and then we uh, started on this part of Mark's portrait of Jesus. Uh, so here uh, we see uh, in right in the first verse of the uh, gospel that Mark presents Jesus as the son of God. And uh, so we see his intention in the book very clearly uh, being, uh, being uh, put down in words right at the start right uh, so one one he says the gospel of uh, jesus christ um uh, the son of god let me just open that up uh, if yeah so uh, the good news about jesus the messiah the son of god and then in verse 11 of the same chapter is where jesus is baptized and then the father uh, affirms jesus as his son and we see at the close of Mark uh, 1539, uh, where Jesus is crucified, that the Roman centurion also says, surely this man was the son of God. So uh, kind of like at the start of the book and at the end of the book, um, the son of God being uh, a very central part to Jesus's identity that Mark wants, uh, wants his readers to, uh, to grasp. Um, the second part of Jesus' identity that he, um, he is talking about is that Jesus is the son of man. Um, now, when he's talking about the son of man, we know uh, from Daniel 7.13, where uh, there's a clear reference to a son of man coming. And so when we see that in the Gospels and when we see that in Mark, uh, it is a reference back to the Messiah, uh, the Messiah's return. Uh, but this is the Messiah's second coming. So Jesus' second coming where he will come back um, to establish fully, uh, uh, establish his kingdom and to judge the world. So uh, the Son of Man um, points to Jesus as Messiah, but it also uh, helps people identify with Jesus as someone who is one with them in their uh suffering he's someone who has identified with people's suffering he's come as a human being so we see as mark talks about jesus that he talks about uh jesus praying jesus uh jesus spending time with sinners with the common people um so jesus is very much human although mark 
presents him as the son of God, he also presents this very human side of Jesus. Um, and then the last part is Jesus the Redeemer. Um, and uh, we'll talk more about this later, but uh, Mark is very, very focused on Jesus' suffering, uh, much more so than the other Gospels. Uh, in fact, one third of this Gospel, of Mark's Gospel, uh, talks about uh, the passion narrative. So uh, one third of it is dedicated to Jesus' crucifixion, his death, his resurrection. Um, so we see just from the amount of content that he's written, uh, that suffering, Jesus' suffering was very, very uh, central to his uh, recollection of Jesus' life, Jesus' ministry, and Jesus' purpose uh, for coming uh, to the earth. And so um, if we can just read these, uh, we, I, I don't think we can read the 14 to 15, but we can just read 1045 maybe, Mark 1045. And someone can read that for us. Mark 1045. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Thank you. So um, this, uh, this is actually something that we see throughout Mark's Gospel, where Jesus uh, is constantly telling his disciples that he's going to die. He's constantly bringing up his suffering um, and his purpose for coming. So uh, that is, uh, we'll also look at why Mark did that. Why did he focus so much on the suffering of Christ? So uh, who wrote the Gospel of Mark? Um, so the, uh, the early church fathers uh, attributed it to John Mark. Uh, we have a few verses here. Maybe we can uh, quickly just read uh, each of these verses in sequence. And it will give us an understanding of who John Mark was. Uh, so we know where this author is coming from and his background. Um, so Acts 12.12, 12, Acts 12.25, and then we'll go on from there. Anybody can open to it and read, please. Acts 12.12. 12. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And Bar 25th verse, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem. When they had fulfilled their ministry, they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Thank you. Um, Colossians 4.10 Colossians 4.10, our, our star Cus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. Thank you. Um, Acts 13.5 and 13. Acts 13, 5, and when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. And verse 13 of the same chapter. Yeah. Now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Thank you. And then Acts 15, 37 to, 40, uh, to 39, sorry. Acts 15? 37 to 39. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia 
and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another, and so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. Thank you. But Paul, okay. Yeah. Uh, and then Second Timothy four eleven and one Peter five thirteen. Second Timothy four eleven. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. Thank you. And First Peter five thirteen. First Peter five thirteen. She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greet you, and so does Mark, my son. Thank you. So, um, what all have we read about Mark uh, from all of these verses? What do we know about Mark? So we know about apostle with Paul. Sorry, could you repeat that, sister? He is an apostle with Paul. He is an apostle with Paul. Thank you. So he served alongside Paul. Um, so these first three uh, points that we have here on the PowerPoint is about his family, right? He's the son of Mary. Uh, he's called John or Mark, and uh, he's a cousin or relative of Barnabas. So those are the three things regarding his family. Um, then we know about his ministry, that he went with Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey. Um, so he accompanied them as they were going to minister. But uh, in the middle of their journey, he returned to Jerusalem. And uh, Paul was very upset about this. And so on the second missionary journey, Paul uh, and Barnabas have a dispute about whether they should take uh, him along with them on the second missionary journey. And because they can't come to agreement on this, Paul and Barnabas separate. And Barnabas takes uh, Mark with him, while Paul uh, takes Silas. Um, and uh, so we see here, uh, for some reason, we don't know very clearly why. Um, why John Mark had left Paul and Barnabas in that first missionary journey, but Paul saw it as um, him abandoning them in the middle of their mission. Uh, but uh, we still see that he is restored um, to Paul in 2 Timothy 4.11. We see Paul talking about Mark as someone who is useful to him. Uh, and we see in a, I've, I don't have the reference here, but there are other references where Paul talks about Mark at a later stage. And um, and then First Peter 5.13 is where we see that uh, John Mark was with Peter, serving with Peter. Uh, and so uh, most of this Gospel of Mark is attributed to Peter's recollection of Jesus's ministry. Um, because John Mark was serving with Peter, uh, he was able to record Peter's um, Peter's account of Jesus and uh, put that down in this gospel. And so he was able to get an eyewitness account from Peter himself, uh, who was one of the closest disciples. So we see in Mark uh, a few instances where Mark talks about where Jesus took Peter, James, and John. Uh, so he gets that inside uh, look at Jesus's ministry, even into those parts where only uh, the three of them were with Jesus uh, and the rest of the disciples were not around. Um, and what is amazing about this is that he records Peter's denial of Jesus as well. So it's a very, um, like we talked about, a very honest account of uh, Jesus's ministry and the disciples' uh, experience of Jesus's ministry. He doesn't try to present uh, Peter as perfect, even though it's Peter's own account um, being recorded here.
Um, so who we know that Mark, John Mark wrote this, uh, but who did he write to? Like we talked about, he wrote to uh, Roman Christians. So it was not a primarily Jewish audience as we saw with Matthew. Uh, and so how he records um, his, uh, his account of Jesus is quite different. Uh, the first thing is that he records Jesus as someone who is always on the move. Uh, so something that would fit the Roman mindset. Um, he uses a transliteration. So uh, Latin was used among the Romans. And so uh, instead of translating those words, because the Romans would understand those words, he just simply uh, transliterates it, which means he puts English alphabets. Um, he wouldn't put English alphabets. He would put uh, Greek alphabets to the Latin word uh, when he was using it. So the examples are denarius and praetorium, uh, where he doesn't try to explain what those words mean or to translate those words for his audience. Um, he doesn't use a lot of Old Testament quotations uh, like Matthew does. He does definitely reference the Old Testament, but not to the extent that Matthew does and not uh, with the same purpose like Matthew uh, talks about fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. Mark doesn't do that as much. Um, Mark also explains a lot of Jewish words and customs in his books, uh, in his book. So he um, he explains uh, the day of preparation, when the day of preparation occurs. Uh, he explains uh, what happens uh, at the time of Passover. So things like that, that will help his audience understand uh, what he was talking about when he mentions the Passover, when he mentions the Sabbath, uh, when he mentions the day of preparation. Uh, he also talks about the Jewish practice of washing their hands before they eat. Uh, so things like that, uh, where he's giving an additional explanation to help his, um, his audience understand why certain things were being done uh, and what was the background, the cultural background behind it. Um, he also doesn't include, he has very limited parables compared to Matthew, uh, but in his parables, he doesn't include uh, parables like the Good Samaritan or the uh, parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, things that would be very, very relevant to Jews, uh, but wouldn't make as much of an impact on uh, a Roman audience, so he doesn't uh, include those kinds of parables in his account. Um, so he wrote to this uh, Roman church uh, or the Roman Christians. Um, it is thought that he wrote because of the persecution that the church was facing. Now, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty about the date of writing of Mark, as is true of uh, most of the books uh, in our New Testament, because uh, all we can do is estimate a date. Uh, so uh, from early AD 60 to late AD 60, there's a slight difference in views on who, uh, when it was written. Uh, but one purpose for writing the book uh, that uh, most people uh, kind of agree on is that it is written to the persecuted church, uh, uh, persecuted Roman church, specifically relating to uh, Nero's persecution. So um, in AD 64, uh, Nero had um, blamed Christians for a fire that uh, happened in, uh, in uh, the city. And brought a lot of destruction. Uh, but uh, what was quite suspicious was that Nero was completely safe during this fire. So it was thought that it was something that he himself had done. But then he blamed Christians for the fire. And he used that as an excuse to start persecuting Christians. Uh, he burned Christians uh, alive. Uh, he used them as torches. Uh, to light up his gardens during the night. Uh, he 
uh, killed other Christians in very severe ways. He uh, fed them to wild animals, so uh, using that as entertainment for the public. Um, he murdered thousands of Roman Christians. Uh, and uh, But still, there were many Christians who were able to escape uh, his escape his grasp. So uh, even though there was so much killing of Christians, there were other Christians who were able to escape, uh, but were still facing persecution because of that. Uh, so Christians saw Nero as a prototype of the Antichrist. They saw him as uh, someone who was um, kind of a, uh, a picture of what the Antichrist would be. Uh, and uh, this letter is written to encourage that persecuted church, that church who is seeing uh, so much death, uh, so much danger, so much uh, violence being committed against them. So we understand why Mark then uh, focuses so much on the suffering of Christ. Um, right, And he not only focuses on the suffering of Christ, he focuses on uh, discipleship and disciples being called to suffer, to follow uh, Christ in his suffering. So let's just look at these verses list listed here, um, starting with Mark 1, 12 to 13. Mark 1, 12 to 13, immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Thank you. So here we see the Holy Spirit baptizing, uh, Jesus being baptized, being filled with the Holy Spirit, and then being led into the wilderness uh, to face a time of temptation, a time of testing. Uh, so to say that um, the Holy Spirit empowers you, um, but the Holy Spirit will also uh, allow you in, allow you to face temptation, but will also uh, strengthen you in that temptation. Uh, so that is one uh, starting right from the first chapter. Uh, Mark is talking about. Uh, testing and temptation. Uh, let's look at Mark 3, 22 and 30. Mark 3, 22. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. Mark 30, because they said he has an unclean spirit. So here where uh, the people saw Jesus' ministry, saw that he was doing good work, but still um, found ways to, uh, to challenge his work, to challenge his ministry. Uh, another encouragement for uh, the church that even if they were engaging in good work, there were there would be people who would come against them, who would find reasons to speak against the work that they were doing. Uh, let's look at Mark 8, 34 to 38. Mark chapter 8, 34 to 38. When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up the take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will to will save it. For what will prof, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words. In this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Thank you. So I would say this 
um, these few verses uh, from Mark 8 uh, kind of give us a summary of the whole book, um, that call to the disciples to follow Jesus um, in the way that Jesus suffered, uh, in the way that Jesus' life uh, was directed to the cross, right? His, uh, his identity as Messiah was closely connected to his suffering. That's what Mark is presenting to us. And so when Jesus is calling his disciples, he's saying, you, um, if you are to follow me, then you have to follow me in this suffering. Uh, and this kind of summarizes what Mark is talking about throughout this book, uh, to tell the church that um, we are called to suffer uh, as Jesus' disciples, as Jesus suffered, uh, to also follow him in his suffering. Uh, can we read the last one, Mark 10, uh, the three verses mentioned there? Can I read, sister? Uh, yes, please. You can start with verse 29, I think, and go right up to verse 34. Okay. Verse 29. So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or fathers, father or mother or wife or children or land for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now at this time houses houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life but many who are first will be last and the last first uh, 32 also sister yes right to now, 34 oh, okay now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going before them. And they were amazed, and as they followed, they were afraid. Then he took the twelve aside again and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed <clears throat> to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him. And the third day he will rise again. Thank you. So um, here as well, we see Jesus' promise, the sacrifices you've made in this life, you will receive uh, a hundredfold in this present age, right? Uh, in in this present life, you will receive a hundredfold along with persecution. Uh, so even though there is a promise of restoration of things that are being sacrificed, there's also uh, the promise of um, persecution uh, that they are going to face. And then again, Jesus talking about his suffering and preparing them uh, for what is to come. So uh, why did uh, Mark do this? He wanted uh, to remind the church that God would move through their faithful witness. So if they would remain faithful even in the face of the persecution that they were facing. Uh, God would move powerfully through them, just as he did through uh, through Jesus' death and resurrection. Um, but he also, at the same time, uh, he, uh, he talks about discipleship uh, leading to uh, suffering, discipleship, including suffering, uh, also uh, the possibility of persecution. Um, but at the same time, he uh, presents the weaknesses of the disciples, right? The disciple, uh, especially Peter's denial of Christ. Uh, so just to encourage them that even if they are not in that place of um, of of completely giving themselves over, uh, giving their lives for Christ, uh, God would help them to get to that place of commitment, uh, like he did with Peter as well. Uh, so 
that uh, that hope that they can uh, they can grow that they don't have to be limited or they don't have to limit themselves to their failures uh, or to their lack of commitment at this time they can believe that god would work in them uh, to help them grow in their commitment to jesus um, so the main theme like we've looked at is that uh, jesus uh, the messiah is a tireless servant of uh, god and man that is uh, that he's constantly working uh, in this in this gospel, we see uh, he's moving from one place to the next, from one uh, miracle to the next. It's just um, he heals somebody, he um, delivers someone from uh, possession, he raises someone from the dead, he moves on. Even in the midst of his uh, healing somebody, somebody else comes uh, comes in and needs healing or asks for deliverance. So there's constantly Jesus uh, working, uh, constantly being surrounded by crowds that were too large to fit into the places where he was uh, ministering. Um, even when they're trying to get away, to take a break, to rest, uh, the crowds follow them even to those places. Uh, so. It is a, a gospel that just presents Jesus um, as someone who is constantly working. He doesn't uh, doesn't have uh, time to even stop to eat in some cases. Um, and another theme that we see here is uh, the fact that Jesus is a Messiah, but he's not. Um, he isn't at this point in the book of Mark as his ministry is being recollected. Um, in his ministry, he didn't want everyone to know that he was the Messiah. Uh, so uh, one of the reasons could be that people wouldn't understand his mission until after his resurrection. If we can just look at Mark 9.9, 9, and someone can read that for us. Mark 9, 9. Now as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no, no one the things they had seen till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Thank you. So um, here we see that uh, Jesus was OK for them to talk about uh, this is specifically with the transfiguration. Uh, post his resurrection, because until his resurrection, people were not going to understand uh, understand his ministry fully. And so he didn't want to reveal himself as a Messiah uh, before that time could come. He wanted to fulfill his mission and then, uh, then declare uh, himself or have his disciples uh, go out and declare who he was and uh, what God had done through his ministry. Uh, another reason uh, that we see in the gospel itself is that Jesus didn't want the large crowds to be following him because as the crowds grew, uh, it uh, kind of constrained his own mission. He had to continue to move on uh, to other places uh, but there would be large crowds who would gather, or who'd be waiting for him, who'd be searching for him. Um, so it gave, it restricted sometimes his ability to keep moving on. At other times, it uh, made it difficult for him and the disciples to get rest. Um, and uh, especially uh, one of the challenges was that the more attention he got, uh, the more the leaders um, of the Jews uh, became hostile towards him and so uh, he didn't want that attention and popularity to grow too quickly before it was time for him to go to the cross uh, so we look at just a few um, accounts that are given mark 145 you can look at that maybe 44 and 45 just to give us some context. Mark 1, 44 and 45. Mark 1, 
44 to 45, and said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in deserted places, and they came to him from every direction. Thank you. So we see that right in the beginning. Um, let's see if we can read one more example. Um, let's uh, read Mark 3, 9 to 10. Mark 3, 9 to 10. So he told his disciples that a small boat should be kept ready for him because of the multitude, lest they should crush him. For he healed many, so that as many as has had afflictions pressed about him to touch him. Thank you. And uh, verse 20 of the same chapter, Mark 3. Then the multitude came together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. So we see uh, uh, just that uh, crowd coming around Jesus because of the miracles. Um, and so this was something that Jesus didn't want uh, uh, to become public information. When he was healing people, uh, especially we see whenever he was uh, delivering people from uh, demonic possession he always silenced the demons because the demons knew who he was and uh, they were um, they they would declare who he is that he's the son of god and so uh, he would silence them before they could say anything else about him uh, so that it would not become public knowledge at this point so uh, we talked about the date of writing of the gospel. Um, so there are different dates given. Um, some, uh, so Irenaeus and some modern scholars, Irenaeus is an early church father, uh, had, have dated it later in uh, AD 60, so 67, 68. Uh, some church fathers, um, uh had put it before ad 62 because uh they say it was used by luke and matthew and uh they say that luke was written while paul was still in prison because acts ends with paul's ministry uh in while he's in prison and that was around ad 62 so some people think that this bookmark must have been written before AD 62 for Luke to have written uh, his account based on the book of Mark. Um, and also uh, the fact that uh, people believe that it, uh, Mark wrote this while he was in Rome, uh, which was around uh, AD 61. So those are some reasons why people say AD 62. Uh, but many present-day scholars say AD 64 uh, because uh, specifically they're relating his writing to the persecution by Nero. And so uh, to be able to account for why he is talking so much about suffering uh, to the uh, to the early church, to the Roman Christians, uh, to relate that back to what they were experiencing at that time. Uh, they say that it would be around AD 64 that he wrote uh, the book. So all of these dates are usually uh, approximate. Uh, we don't know for sure, but in, in the 60s is when it's usually uh, thought to be written. And th this is the first of the Gospels. Um, so some of the distinctive features about the Book of Mark is that it's the shortest gospel. It opens with the divinity of Christ. Uh, so like the Book of John talks about Christ, uh, about Jesus being divine, Jesus being uh, present from the beginning with the Father. Uh, Mark also presents Jesus as the Son of God right from the start. But instead of presenting him um, 
in the way that John does. John does it a lot through his explanation of uh, that word logos. Uh, Mark does it through recounting Jesus's miracles. So proving Jesus's divinity through the work that he did, uh, through his power, through his authority uh, over um, all kinds of sickness and disease and demons and nature, uh, all of those things uh, proving Jesus uh, that Jesus is divine. Uh, again, we uh, see uh, Mark presenting both the divinity and humanity of Jesus, uh, talking about Jesus' emotions, uh, as, especially as he's going to the cross um, where he's praying uh, and asking the Father to take away the cup if it be his will. So presenting that human side of Jesus as well. Um, and then, uh, like we said, Mark presents more of the miracles, the work, uh, that Jesus did rather than the teaching or the uh, prophecy um, uh, prophecy fulfillment or prophecies that Jesus made about the end times. He doesn't focus so much on those things. Uh, so Mark records 19 miracles that Jesus did during his ministry. Uh, so um, we have a list of all the miracles. So. Uh, miracles where he was healing disease, that's with Peter's mother-in-law, the healing of the leper, uh, the paralyzed man who was healed. Uh, this is the paralyzed man who was lowered uh, in front of him while he's, uh, while he's inside the house preaching to a large crowd. Um, then uh, the man with the withered hand, uh, the deaf and dumb man who's healed, uh, the blind man of Bethsaida, a woman with the blood issue, that's a woman, uh, woman who's suffering for 12 years, and then Bartimaeus, who is also a blind man who's healed. Uh, so eight miracles of healing from sickness. Um, and then there are five miracles uh, that prove his power over nature. So uh, where he stills the storm, he feeds the 5,000, he walks on the water, he feeds 4,000, and then he curses the fig tree uh, because it doesn't have any fruit. So um, those are miracles over nature. And then we have four miracles over demonic forces um, in Jerusalem, in Gadarenes, um, the Syrophoenician and the demoniac son. Uh, so um, let me just open the Mark 125 really quickly. So this is the first Mark 125 is the first uh, demon possessed man uh, that is accounted in the book of Mark. Uh, and here is where he silences uh, the demon. And we also see that in other accounts as well. Um, but here, uh, he Jesus goes into a synagogue and there's an impure there's someone who's possessed and that person uh, says I know who you are the holy one of God so that's the first account of Jesus uh, uh, freeing someone who had been possessed by demons in gatherings we know it's the man who is uh, possessed by the legion of uh, demons. Uh, the Syrophoenician woman is where her daughter has been possessed and she asks Jesus for a miracle. Um, Jesus says, I've been sent only for the uh, people of Israel. And then she says, even dogs um, eat the crumbs that fall from the children's table. And so Jesus heals her daughter. And the demoniac son is uh, where um, the disciples are unable to heal heal uh, or to yeah to heal the son that uh, is possessed by a demon that throws him in fire that uh, makes him fall down and foam at the mouth uh, and so when Jesus returns after his transfiguration uh, the father of the son asks Jesus to heal his son and Jesus heals him um, so and then the last two is Jesus uh, two miracles that prove his power over death itself. Uh, the first is Jairus's daughter, so Jairus's synagogue leader, and he asked Jesus to uh, heal his daughter. Um, his daughter dies while Jesus is still on the way, and then 
Jesus still continues to go to the house and uh, raises her from the dead. And then uh, the resurrection of Jesus himself, proving his power over death. Uh, so you can see in a very short gospel, uh, 19 miracles recorded. Um, so we'll stop here. We'll continue uh, from here on Monday. Um, thank you all for joining. And if you have, if you're able to read through some of Mark before Monday, uh, please do try and do that. Thank you.